Interesting, because of her family connections, which have played a significant role in her career. Judy Moran was denied bail because her possession of weapons posed a risk to the community. What I did was horrible. There's, there's nothing to say to justify it. You can't justify it. That's reports. Now a judge has agreed there was miscommunication between Cook and her former... To make a public apology to the court for her ill-advised... We were sure that she was coming home, that she was looking at community control and house arrest and we put our faith in him. Number 15, Sandra Avila Beltran. In the dark underbelly of the Mexican drug trade where power and violence collide, one name stood out among the rest, Sandra Avila Beltran. Known as the Queen of the Pacific, Sandra's story was one of family connections, intrigue, and a rise to power that captivated the media and struck fear into the hearts of her rivals. Born into a world tainted by crime, Sandra's family ties played a significant role in shaping her destiny. With relatives linked to infamous cartel leaders like Rafael Caro Quintero and the Beltran Leva brothers, she inherited a legacy drenched in blood and power. Her mother's family had a history of involvement in heroin smuggling, which later expanded into the lucrative cocaine trade. It was a world she couldn't escape, and one that she embraced with ruthless determination. Sandra was no stranger to danger, unafraid to wield the violence that came with her territory. Mexican officials claim that she employed the typical intimidation tactics of Mexico's criminal organizations, leaving no doubt about her ruthlessness. Her personal life was intertwined with the drug trade as well. She had affairs with several notorious drug barons and married ex-police officers who turned to the dark side, only to meet their ultimate demise at the hands of their enemies. But it was her relationship with Juan Diego Espinosa Ramirez, known as Elias the Tiger, that proved to be a turning point in her ascent to power. Interesting, because of her family connections, which have played a significant role in her career. Judy Moran was denied bail because her possession of weapons posed a risk to the community. August 10th, 2012, she was finally extradited to the United States to face criminal charges. Familia rivals. Despite her position in the organization, Rosetta maintained a low profile. Cutolo was the mastermind behind one of Italy's most notorious organized crime syndicates. Elias, an influential figure in Colombia's Norte del Valle cartel, became Sandra's partner and ally. With his support, Sandra's grip on the drug world tightened as she established herself in Guadalajara and Hermosillo. For years, Sandra operated in the shadows, leaving no evidence for the authorities to find. But her high-profile lifestyle couldn't shield her from the consequences of her actions forever. In a surprising twist of fate, her teenage son was kidnapped, prompting Sandra to seek help from the very authority she had skillfully avoided for so long. The incident raised suspicions, triggering an investigation that would eventually lead to her downfall. It took over four years and the efforts of 30 federal agents to finally apprehend Sandra. She was charged with organized crime and drug trafficking conspiracy, although some charges were later dropped. Detained on suspicion of illegal weapon possession and money laundering, she awaited extradition to the US. In August 2012, Sandra's reign came to an end as she was finally extradited to the U.S. to face criminal charges. It marked the end of an era, the fall of a queen who had reigned over the treacherous world of the Mexican drug trade. The media held her as one of the most dangerous female gang leaders, a title she had earned through her cunning, connections, and unwavering ambition. Sandra Avila Beltran's story serves as a chilling reminder of the depths to which humanity can sink in pursuit of power and wealth. Her journey from a young girl with family ties to a notorious criminal empire to the pinnacle of the drug trade is a testament to the complex and often tragic nature of life in the underworld. As her chapter closes, her legacy as the Queen of the Pacific will forever be etched in the annals of criminal history. After her 2007 arrest, asked what she did for a living, she described herself as a homemaker, is back in her native Mexico after being deported from the United States. She was held for five years in a Mexican federal prison before being extradited last year to the United States. States Now back in her homeland, the legal troubles of the 52-year-old queen pin seem to be far from over. And an infamous reputation for being a powerful woman in the male-dominated underworld. Number 14, Lisa Montgomery. Lisa Montgomery, born in 1968, endured a tumultuous upbringing marked by parental attack and her own mental health struggles. After a series of challenging relationships and marriages, 
Montgomery committed a heinous crime in 2004. She slayed Bobby Jo Stinnett, who was eight months pregnant, and forcibly removed the unborn baby from her womb. Despite the baby's survival and subsequent reunion with her father, Montgomery was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to capital punishment in 2007. After numerous legal delays, Montgomery was executed by lethal injection on January 13, 2021 at the Federal Correctional Complex in Indiana. Her case sparked controversy, with divergent opinions regarding her mental state and the appropriateness of the penalty. Lisa strangled Bobby Joe, then took steps to remove her. Put her fingers put the baby inside her coat and went out the door and got in the vehicle and drove off. Number 13, the Low Russo Clan. Within the complex and treacherous world of organized crime, few names evoke as much fear and respect as the Lo Russo clan. Operating in the heart of Naples, Italy, this powerful criminal organization has established itself as a dominant force in the Neapolitan underworld. Led by a lineage of ruthless leaders, the Lo Russo clan has left an indelible mark on the region's history of organized crime. The roots of the Lo Russo clan can be traced back several decades, when they began as a small-time criminal gang in the impoverished neighborhood of Second Ligliano. Over the years, through a combination of shrewd tactics, brutal violence, and strategic alliances, the clan managed to expand its influence and rise through the ranks of the Camorra, Naples' notorious criminal syndicate. However, it was under the leadership of Maria Lo Russo that the clan truly flourished. Born and raised in Secondigliano, Maria was no stranger to the world of crime. Her entire family had been involved in the Camorra, with her father being a well-known local boss and her brothers rising through the ranks. Following her husband's arrest, Maria became the first female boss of the Secondigliano Alliance, a coalition of powerful Camorra gangs that controlled drug trafficking and extortion rackets in many of Naples' suburbs. Maria's ascension to power marked a turning point for the clan. Under her direction, the alliance became more organized, secretive, sophisticated, and most importantly, more powerful. She introduced revolutionary changes to the clan, such as the inclusion of bodywork, a previously prohibited activity according to the Camorra's code of conduct. This move not only enhanced the clan's criminal activities, but also significantly increased their income. Tragically, it also meant that many underage girls were enslaved and forced into bodywork, further highlighting the ruthlessness of Maria's reign. However, Maria's grip on power was not without its challenges. A disagreement over a shipment of pure unrefined heroin proved to be the catalyst for her downfall. Recognizing the potential harm the powerful drug could cause to the Alliance's customer base, Maria refused to sell it. This decision put her at odds with the La Russo clan, a rival faction within the Camorra that had always opposed her leadership. The La Russo clan seized the opportunity and took matters into their own hands, packaging the heroin for street sale. The consequences were dire, as numerous drug addicts throughout Naples lost their lives, sparking widespread public outrage. Public pressure and the mounting toll led to intensified police crackdowns on the Camorra clans. Maria's reign came to an abrupt end when she was arrested and incarcerated. However, even behind bars, she continued to command the clan's operations, a testament to the resilience and influence of the Camorra. The Lo Russo clan's legacy is one of violence, power, and dominance. Their rise to prominence and subsequent fall underscores the volatile nature of organized crime and the constant struggle for supremacy within criminal underworlds. While their reign may have ended, the impact of the Lo Russo clan on Naples' criminal landscape will not be forgotten, serving as a stark reminder of the enduring presence of organized crime and its devastating consequences. Number 12. Judith Marianne Moran Within the annals of Australian criminal history, 
few names resonate as powerfully as Judith Marianne Moran. Born on December 18, 1944, Moran's life story reads like a script from a gritty gangster movie, punctuated by violence, tragedy, and a prominent role in the notorious Melbourne gangland slings. Moran's involvement in the criminal underworld began with her marriage to Leslie John Johnny Cole in 1963. Tragically, Johnny was slayed in a drug-related gangland conflict in Sydney in 1982, setting the stage for the turbulence that would define Moran's life. Together, they had a son named Mark Moran, who would later change his name. However, the family's criminal associations did not end with Johnny's demise. In fact, they only grew deeper. Moran's path took a new turn when she began dating Louis Moran in 1966. Louis, who would later become her brother-in-law, was also deeply involved in organized crime. Their relationship resulted in the birth of their son Jason in 1967. However, as with her previous marriage, the union with Lewis did not stand the test of time and they divorced in 1995. They found her guilty of orchestrating the murder of her brother-in-law. Des Moran was gunned down in a cafe. No longer the weeping widow, Judy Moran is a convicted killer. This is the last vision of her victim. Denied any part in the murder of her brother-in-law, Des Moran. Is a, uh, safe in the wall? Yeah. CCTV cameras captured the frightened reaction as shots killed Des Moran. The trial heard Judy Mor Moran. Police raided her house that night. Judy has explained in the car for a search warrant to search these. The early 2000s marked a turning point for Moran's criminal activities. Tragedy struck the family when Mark Moran was assassinated in 2000, followed by the assassination of Jason in 2003. The wave of violence that engulfed the Moran family intensified when Lewis himself was slayed in 2004. These shocking events catapulted Judith Marianne Moran into the public eye and solidified her position within the Melbourne gangland landscape. However, Moran's involvement in the gangland saga didn't end with the tragic demise of her loved ones. The plot thickened when her brother-in-law, Des Moran, was slayed in Ascot Vale in June 2009. In a twist of fate, Moran and three others were later arrested in connection with Des's slaying. According to the charges, Moran was accused of concealing the getaway car in her garage and disposing of it. When the police searched Moran's home, they allegedly uncovered a hidden safe containing weapons, stolen license plates, a wig, and clothing that matched the description provided by witnesses. The legal proceedings that followed were no less dramatic. Moran was denied bail due to concerns that her possession of weapons posed a risk to the community. In 2011, she was found guilty of slaying Desmond Moran by a jury, a verdict that led to her receiving a sentence of 26 years in prison with a minimum of 21 years to be served. Her involvement in the Melbourne gangland slayings, the violent demise of her family members, and her subsequent incarceration have solidified her place in Australian criminal folklore. Her life is a testament to the destructive power of criminal organizations and the lasting impact they have on communities and families. As Australia continues to grapple with the legacy of its gangland era, figures like Judith Marianne Moran serve as cautionary tales, reminding society of the devastating consequences that arise when criminal ambitions overshadow the value of human life. Suzanne Kane denied knowing anything about the crime. Do you know anything about that? No, we don't. She later pleaded guilty. He dumped the getaway car. Today, a jury found the 66-year-old grandmother planned the killing. Brand believed he was swindling her out of millions and plotted to kill him. She drove gunman Jeffrey Arders. It can now be revealed all of Judy Moran's co-accused have admitted to the part they played in the shooting. It surprised me that she gave no reaction. We've had plenty of questions asked by this jury over the seven days. They disguise a wig and a cap that was worn by the gunman Jeffrey Armour, secreted. Right. Yes, yeah, so, so she took the stand herself. What was her defence? Number 11, Sintoya Brown. Sintoya Brown, a 16-year-old victim of trafficking, was convicted of slaying and sentenced to life without parole in 2004. However, her case gained widespread attention, leading to her eventual clemency in 2019, granted by Tennessee Governor Bill Haslam. Brown's troubled upbringing, marked by parental absence and attack, led her to a life of homelessness and survival through bodywork. When she encountered Johnny Allen, she shot him, claiming self-defense and fearing for her safety. Supporters argue that Brown should not be held fully accountable due to her trafficking victimization. Governor Haslam, acknowledging her rehabilitation, granted her release from prison in August 2019. Since then, Brown has been actively advocating for criminal justice reform and raising awareness about trafficking. 
I just wanted to say thank you first. I know a lot of people get to see you. What I did was horrible. There's, there's nothing to say to justify it. You can't justify it. The juvenile public defender who was defending Centoya gave me a call and said, we just arrested somebody. Um, but I have prayed for a very long time. <sighs> who we think you ought to meet. Officials in Tennessee granted Berman access to the then teenager. In Tennessee, that carries a life sentence, 60 years behind bars. But as the world outside evolved, Brown grew up behind bars. Ours. I have a college degree now. Um, I have a family, a whole new family. Down. Yeah, I won't. I promise. Number 10, Penelope Soto. Penelope Soto, a young woman hailing from a privileged background, found herself in a bond hearing, confronted with charges that had led her before a judge. However, her conduct during the proceedings left an indelible mark on those present in the courtroom. So are you working? Yes. How much money are you making a week approximately? Bye-bye. As the judge addressed Soto, elucidating the purpose of the hearing and the gravity of the charges laid against her, her demeanor appeared far from respectful. Rather than exhibiting the expected decorum, she displayed a shocking lack of respect, audaciously laughing at the judge and even making derogatory remarks about his Cuban heritage. This revealed a disconcerting disregard for the court's authority and left onlookers aghast. Understandably infuriated by Soto's blatant disrespect, the judge swiftly summoned her back to the stand. With a firm tone and unwavering gaze, he doubled her bond, recognizing that her behavior demanded appropriate consequences. Additionally, he sentenced her to 30 days in jail for contempt of court, underscoring the gravity of her actions. In the aftermath of the sentencing, Penelope Soto appeared to grasp the gravity of her conduct. She issued a genuine apology, acknowledging the wrongfulness of her behavior. Recognizing her remorse and perhaps wishing to provide an opportunity for personal growth, the judge displayed leniency. He encouraged Soto to seek counseling, expressing his belief in her capacity for rehabilitation and transformation. Again. Gun one would be ten thousand. To make a public apology to the court for her ill-advised. <clears throat> yes, I understand completely, and I apologize. Charges be dropped. My behavior was very irrational. And I apologize. Number 9. Kyandria Cook Kyandria Cook's sentencing became an internet sensation, capturing widespread attention due to her highly emotive response. Despite being just 18 years old, Kyandria found herself entangled in a complex scheme orchestrated through a dating app, tragically culminating in the shooting of another teenager. Her involvement led to a conviction for carjacking, resulting in a significant sentence of 20 years. As the verdict was delivered, Kyandria's mother unleashed a torrent of pent-up emotions that overwhelmed her. The courtroom reverberated with her anguished screams, cries, and profound distress, triggering a cascade of emotions within Kyandria herself. Overwhelmed by her mother's outburst and the immense weight of her sentence, Kyandria crumbled under the crushing burden of her own emotions. Reports. Now a judge has agreed there was miscommunication between Cook and her former attorney. It's probably the best idea, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, let's get the PSI, then I'll leave it to the attorney, dear attorney, so give you the rest of the advice. Fair enough? Okay. Anything else? Keandria Cook's new attorneys had to prove a standard called manifest injustice to unravel her plea and... We were sure that she was coming home, that she was looking at community control and house arrest. And we put our faith in him. Confusion to meet the injustice standard, so Cook is a defendant again, not yet convicted or... Tears streamed down her face as she grappled to comprehend the gravity of her actions and the lifelong repercussions that awaited her. 
The viral nature of Kyandria's reaction thrust her case into the public eye, illuminating the emotional turmoil she endured throughout the sentencing process. Her emotional breakdown encapsulated the indescribable internal struggle one faces when confronted with the reality of irreversible actions and the heavy toll that must be paid. Were they face to face? No, sir. Okay, how did you see them? With a video conference. And that video conference was taken in this case? No, sir. Have you heard any, your statement made in this case? No, sir. Okay. Uh, was he professional? Yes, sir. Did you believe the things that he said to you? Yes, sir. Okay. Video conference, what was that for? Um, he was telling me that I can go home with pre-trial release so I can finish school. So the manifest injustice that does exist here is not the, um, the sentence itself. It's the Number eight, Rosetto Cutolo. Within the complex and intricate world of Italian organized crime, few figures have held as much influence and power as Rosetta Cutolo. As the sister of Rafael Cutolo, the boss of the Nueva Camorra Organizata, Rosetta played a crucial role in one of Italy's most notorious criminal syndicates. Her story is one of strategic cunning, negotiation, and a fierce commitment to preserving her brother's criminal empire. Rosetta Cutolo emerged as a key player in the NCO, which was led by her brother Rafael, a man known for his megalomaniacal nature and his ability to maintain control despite spending a significant portion of his life behind bars. When Rafael found himself incarcerated, Rosetta stepped in to ensure the smooth operation of the organization. She carried out his orders, nurtured his devoted followers, and solidified the NCO's position in the criminal landscape. As a negotiator, Rosetta excelled. She established connections with cocaine barons in South America and even attended high-level meetings with representatives of the Sicilian Mafia and Camorra clans, all in an effort to end the violent and bloody war between the NCO and their rivals, the Nueva Familia. Rosetta's skills as a negotiator and her dedication to maintaining the stability of the NCO were critical in solidifying the organization's power and influence. Despite her position within the criminal syndicate, Rosetta chose to maintain a low profile. She led a seemingly ordinary life, tending to her roses and avoiding the spotlight. This stark contrast to her brother, who relished giving interviews and making courtroom speeches, allowed Rosetta to operate behind the scenes, directing operations from various safe houses scattered throughout the city. One such safe house was the Castle Marecchio, a sprawling 16th-century palace with 365 rooms, tennis courts, and a swimming pool, providing Rosetta with direct access to the prisons of Pozzuoli and Ascoli Piceno. It was from this stronghold that she commanded the NCO's activities, ensuring the organization's continued dominance in the face of relentless law enforcement efforts. However, the authorities eventually caught up with Rosetta. In October 1981, police raided the castle Marichio while she presided over an NCO meeting. Remarkably, Rosetta managed to escape undercover, accompanied by the neighborhood priest in a car. Her disappearance from public view only deepened the mystery surrounding her activities, and she operated covertly for over a decade. Eventually, in February 1993, Rosetta's luck ran out. Police discovered her hiding place, and she surrendered. She faced charges of mafia affiliation and was sentenced to nine years in prison. However, the sentence was later reduced to five years, and she was acquitted of nine slaying charges. Rosetta Cotolo's ability to convince authorities of her harmlessness and her unassuming appearance played a significant role in shaping her legal outcome. While her brother Rafael remained the more public face of the NCO, Rosetta's behind-the-scenes influence and strategic prowess were crucial to the organization's survival. The story of Rosetta Cotolo serves as a testament to the enduring power and complexity of organized crime in Italy. Her role within the NCO and her ability to navigate the criminal underworld highlight the intricate dynamics at play within these criminal networks. Rosetta's legacy is one of cunning, adaptability, and a determination to protect her brother's criminal enterprise, leaving an indelible mark on the history of Italian organized crime. Number 7. Tatiana Fusiari Tatiana Fusiari, a woman associated with the sovereign citizen movement, faced conviction for the slaying and child attack resulting in the tragic demise of her 10-month-old daughter, Mary Welch. Alongside her husband, Seth, they held beliefs that the government held no authority over citizens, leading them to refuse medical assistance when Mary fell ill. Mary Welch was born on October 23, 2010, bringing joy to her parents' lives. Initially healthy, her condition deteriorated at 10 months, experiencing symptoms such as fever, vomiting, and diarrhea. 
Fuzari and Welch opted to treat her at home using natural remedies, employing herbs and essential oils. Regrettably, Mary's condition did not improve. On August 2, 2018, Fuzari contacted emergency services, reporting that Mary was unresponsive. Finger, chest compression on her, and then I wiped her mouth. At this point in time, why do you think Mary did pass? Why do you think she did that? Can't lose that much in two days. She, I've never seen a child. You would think she was part of natural selection? She, I mean, she's always been small. She's always. I did, I did not know what was wrong with her. Mother testifying against her husband today during her own murder trial. Tatiana Fusari. Upon arriving at the scene, authorities discovered Mary's lifeless body. Tragically, she weighed merely eight pounds and bore bruises on her person. An autopsy revealed Mary's cause of demise as malnutrition and dehydration. Subsequently, both Fazari and Welch were apprehended, charged with slaying and child attack. Although they pleaded not guilty, they were ultimately found guilty during the trial. As a consequence, Fazari received a life sentence without the possibility of parole, while Welch was sentenced to life imprisonment with the potential for parole after 25 years. Fazari's case raises profound concerns regarding the perils of religious extremism. As adherents of the sovereign citizen movement, they adhered to the belief that the government lacked authority over its citizens. This ideology led them to deny crucial medical assistance to their child culminating in a devastating outcome. The case of Tatiana Fuziari is an immense tragedy as it highlights the life cut short of Mary Welch. Mary, a young child with a promising future, fell victim to her parents' religious convictions. This serves as a stark reminder of the dangers associated with extremism. Furthermore, Fuziari's case prompts contemplation about the role of women within religious cults. She was a young and susceptible individual who was drawn into the sovereign citizen movement by her husband. Once involved, she experienced isolation from her loved ones, subject to the control of her husband. This control extended to decisions concerning Mary's medical care, resulting in devastating consequences. Why didn't you take her and bring her to the doctor instead? I did not want word to get back to him. To face the wall, so he would just, just leave the cold. And I did not want her to be cold anymore. <laughs> where I'm sitting. Uh, I'm not sure that I'll ever understand what these parents were. I think he left the room. I don't remember him being there anymore. I just, I just remember doing the thinking or doing to, uh, I guess I would have to say, literally watch their child start. Number six, Alexandria Thomas. During Alexandria Thomas's hearing at the Palm Beach County Jail in Florida, a heart-wrenching scene unfolded. She stood accused of fatally knifing her boyfriend outside a supermarket in Palm Beach, facing grave charges that carried immense gravity. It's in a stabbing case that had a local mother and daughter breaking down in court. Chris McGrath at the Palm Beach County Jail with the... And she loves very much. It's an unfortunate incident. <laughs> Appearance, the suspect and her mother breaking down in court when they found out just how serious these charges are. I, I, I know she's very worried about the victim of what took place. <laughs> However, the true magnitude of the situation struck her with overwhelming force when the judge revealed that her boyfriend was in a medically induced coma. The news devastated Alexandria, engulfing her in a torrent of intense emotions. The weight of the charges against her, combined with the critical condition of her boyfriend, unleashed an overwhelming wave of anguish. In the courtroom, her mother stood by her side, sharing in her daughter's torment and further intensifying the emotional atmosphere. Their visible distress painted a poignant tableau of remorse and agony. The emotional breakdown displayed by Alexandria and her mother portrayed the profound remorse and anguish they experienced in that pivotal moment. It served as a powerful reminder of the far-reaching consequences stemming from the tragic events surrounding the incident. The weight of their actions bore heavily upon their hearts, leaving an indelible mark on their lives. Number 5. Erica May Butts and Shanita Lewis Cunningham Erica May Butts and Shanita Lewis Cunningham, convicted for the slaying of young Serenity Richardson, were handed life sentences that left a lasting impact.
As the judge announced their sentences in court, both offenders experienced profound emotional turmoil, breaking down in tears and screams. The intensity of the moment extended to Erica's mother, whose reaction was so intense that she had to be escorted out of the courtroom. The distressing scene concluded with both convicts being assisted out of the court premises in wheelchairs. Number 4. Regina Johnson Regina Johnson, found guilty of the slayings of her husband and daughter, displayed intense anger during her sentencing. Vanessa Van Hefty explains why Johnson says she only killed her husband and that was in self-defense. Vanessa. The love of my life. Leah was my life. It was just the two of us liked it. He was the one that killed their daughter and he was set to kill her too. It's when I lost her, I lost everything. I lost everything. Despite asserting that she acted in self-defense against her abusive husband, the court rendered a guilty verdict for both slayings. In a courtroom outburst, Regina expressed her emotions by inscribing accusatory messages on a mirror using red lipstick, laying blame on her late husband. As a result, she was sentenced to 80 years in prison, effectively condemning her to spend the rest of her life incarcerated. Nation for that will tell you what it is tonight at 7. Reporting live from the Hall of Justice, Vanessa Van Hatton. Second degree murder twice, but not first degree. And I think what she did was misinterpret. I mean, that was his daughter too, but he killed her. Johnson says she and I wanted to shoot him because of the affairs he was having. I would have shot Reuben a long time ago. He might try to kill me. So I picked it up and I, I shot him. Number three, Maria Leon. Maria Leon was a formidable figure in the criminal underworld. She had 13 children and was involved in drugs, slaying, and other criminal activities. Maria's life took a tragic turn when her son, Danny Clever Leon, was slayed in a shootout with the police in 2008. Wanting to attend her son's funeral in the US, Maria faced a significant obstacle. Having served time in US prison, she was banned from re-entering the country. Determined to find a way, Maria contacted a human smuggler named Alvarez Marquez for assistance in crossing the border. Alvarez Marquez was known for his unconventional methods of smuggling people and goods across the border. He had previously bought a three-month-old baby and a truck of Chinese workers hidden in a freezer truck. Maria's request posed a unique challenge, but Alvarez Marquez was up for it. One suggestion he made was for Maria to jump the border fence. Another option was to swim beneath the fence through the highly polluted New River which flowed from Mexicali to Calexico, California. Both options were risky and demanded courage. While planning Maria's border crossing, Alvarez made a crucial mistake. Unbeknownst to him, the authorities were listening in on his phone conversation with Maria's son, Francisco Real. The feds were investigating Francisco, suspecting him of being a top member of the Drew Street Gang, which had connections to Maria's criminal empire. Upon discovering Alvarez's plan to smuggle Maria across the border, the authorities acted swiftly. They followed up on the tip and arrested him on charges of conspiracies to smuggle, transport, and harbor illegal aliens. In the process, they also apprehended up to 25 other gang members and illegal aliens. Maria Leon's fate was sealed. She was sentenced to eight years in prison for her involvement in the criminal activities that had marked her life. Despite her incarceration, Maria's influence in the criminal world lingered as prisons often failed to impede the reach of powerful criminal figures. Maria's story highlights the complexities and dangers of a life entangled in the criminal underworld. Her determination to attend her son's funeral at any cost and her connection to a network of smugglers and gang members underscore the lengths to which individuals in her position are willing to go. Although Maria faced legal consequences for her actions, her tale serves as a reminder of the enduring power and influence that certain individuals can wield even within the confines of a prison cell. Maria Leon will be remembered as a woman who navigated the treacherous world of crime, leaving an indelible mark on those who crossed her path. Number 2. Jody Herring Jody Herring, driven by a profound sense of anguish, tragically ended the life of Laura Sobel, a dedicated social worker who had made the difficult decision to remove Herring's daughter from her custody. 
consumed by a vengeful desire for retribution, Herring's action spiraled out of control, resulting in the untimely demise of three of her own relatives. We cannot forget this crime. We do not forget it. It does not just change you. It demolishes you. Court, but of course, uh, the vict those closest to the victims are very happy with this outcome. I'm glad that, that it was recognized that that matters. I can't take back that, that day. I wish I could, but I can't. Family. I can no longer feel happiness. The emotions I feel every day make it hard to just... As the courtroom proceedings unfolded, Herring, overwhelmed with remorse, shed tears and expressed her deep apologies, acknowledging the irreparable loss of life. However, Sobel's sister passionately argued that Herring should not be granted any semblance of freedom, firmly believing in the weight of her sister's tragic demise. Considering the gravity of Herring's crimes, the presiding judge ultimately ruled in accordance with the severity of the situation sentencing Herring to life imprisonment. Decision, and, and she says it later, if I have to go to jail for the rest of my life, it was worth it. Gunned down outside her offices at the DCF. The judge said that nobody should ever feel threatened or... We are very glad that, um, that she will never live a free day in her life. Number one, Maria Licciardi. In the shadows of Naples, where the Camorra's grip was unyielding, a woman emerged from the chaos, shattering the glass ceiling of the criminal underworld. Her name was Maria Licciardi, and she was a force to be reckoned with, a queen among kings, a mastermind in a world dominated by men. Born and raised in Secondigliano, a Neapolitan suburb steeped in the blood-soaked history of the Camorra, Maria's destiny seemed sealed from the moment she took her first breath. The Licciardi clan, her family, had deep roots in the criminal organization. Her father, a well-known local boss, and her brothers, rising through the ranks, paved the way for her ascent. But it was Maria's own indomitable spirit and unwavering ambition that propelled her to the summit of the criminal world. When her brothers and husband were arrested, leaving a power vacuum within the Camorra, Maria seized the opportunity. She became the first female boss of the Secondigliano Alliance, a coalition of powerful Camorra gangs controlling the drug trade and extortion rackets in Naples suburbs. Maria was a trailblazer, defying societal norms and challenging the patriarchal structure of the Camorra. Under her iron rule, the alliance grew more organized, secretive, sophisticated, and powerful. She orchestrated their criminal activities with precision, expanding their reach and filling their coffers. But Maria's reign was not without its dark side. She revolutionized the alliance by introducing bodywork, an activity previously prohibited by the Camorra's code of conduct. This move enhanced their criminal enterprise and bolstered their income. However, it came at a grave cost. Countless underage girls were enslaved, forced into a life of exploitation and degradation, often under the influence of drugs. Maria's thirst for power blinded her to the suffering of these innocent souls. Yet it was a disagreement over a shipment of pure, unrefined heroin that would seal Maria's fate. She refused to sell it, deeming it too powerful for the average user, a decision driven by calculated business sense. But the rival LaRusso clan saw an opportunity, packaging the lethal substance for street sale. The consequences were dire. Addicts across Naples fell victim to the heroin, triggering widespread public outrage. The streets roared with anger, demanding justice for the lives lost. The authorities could no longer ignore the Camorra stranglehold on their city. A massive police crackdown ensued, aimed at dismantling the Secondigliano alliance and bringing Maria to her knees. In the chaos that followed, Maria's empire crumbled. She was arrested, her freedom extinguished, and her reign of terror halted. But prisons could not contain the spirit of the Camorra, and Maria continued to command her clan from behind bars, her influence echoing through the ranks. Released in 2009 after nearly eight years, Maria tasted fleeting freedom. However, the past could never truly be left behind. In 2021, the long arm of justice caught up with her once more. Arrested for leading the Camorra gang while attempting to flee to Spain, Maria Licciardi faced her final reckoning. Her fate sealed by the weight of her crimes, Maria was sentenced to 12 years and 8 months in jail. The walls that surrounded her now symbolized the end of an era, a testament to the rise and fall of a woman who defied convention and carved her name into the bloody tapestry of the Camorra. Maria Licciardi's story is a reminder of the indomitable spirit that can flourish even in the darkest corners of society. Her legacy, a tale of power, ambition, and ruthlessness, serves as a haunting reminder that in the realm of organized crime, even the fiercest queens are not impervious 
to the relentless pursuit of justice. That's all for this video, folks. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching.